Well, what obsessed me about this story, one was Aubrey McClendon, who I think is one of the world's great business characters, but two, um, this question, how can an industry that doesn't make money, and it's not clear it ever will money be, make money, be changing the world as much as fracking indisputably is? And it's a really interesting conundrum. Um, thus far, the frackers haven't proven that they can produce free cash flow, and I think the big question for the country as we beat our chests about American energy independence is how much oil and gas would we produce if companies had to live within cash flow? Your premise basically is that they've just incurred so much debt uh, because this is a highly capital intensive business to begin with. Yes, it has revolutionized the energy industry in the world, but at what cost? But and it, that's what it comes down to, right? That's a great question. It's a great way of putting it. It doesn't make money for shareholders. And so how long will Wall Street's largas continue? How long will we start keep funding a money-losing business? And what does it mean if the cash dries up? It depends on what time frame you're looking at. I mean, you could take a, a chart of Chesapeake and say, you know, since 98 to 2008 when oil prices peaked, it actually went from a dollar, the equivalent of a dollar a share to 64. So investors could have made plenty of money. And so investors as a whole see this sort of rise and think, you know what, there is money to be made. Well, one of the interesting things about the business is that stock prices have been somewhat disconnected from actual profits. So in that way, it's reminiscent of something like the first dot-com boom when companies were measured by eyeballs, right? So fracking companies, exploration companies are scored, they're publicly traded companies, by their growth in production, um, not by the amount of cash they're, they're producing. But that's starting to change. There's a rebellion in the investor community, and investors are starting to say, we want to see returns. What, doesn't doesn't uh, it also get complicated in the way that it's changed geopolitics and America's place in the energy world? It has, it has changed things immensely. Just look no further than Saudi Arabia and what's happening in that country, the rise of MBS, um, 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 to see the pressure that low oil prices, which are partly a result of American fracking, are exerting um, on the rest of the world. It's, it's, it's dramatic. How would you see this playing out? I mean, if you feel like the seeds are being sown of, the, of another financial crisis in the fracking industry, you make the point that a lot of this has been facilitated by the low interest rates that we've enjoyed for the last decade because of the financial crisis. So now as the Fed is raising rates, is that what sparks a possible crisis here as well? I think it might spark a lot of things. There's that old saying that is so true, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? right? And the massive debt bubble that we've, we've had since the Fed chopped interest rates so dramatically, even before the financial crisis, but especially in the wake of the financial crisis, has arguably caused bubbles in a whole lot of asset classes, and fracking is just one example. But part of the argument I make in the book is that we never would have had a fracking boom. There wouldn't have been a shale revolution if it hadn't been for ultra-low interest rates in the wake of the financial crisis. So you don't think of these two events, the, the rise of American oil and gas and the financial crisis as being related, but they actually are.